It's the mid 14th century and a young woman is dying. At 33 and a half years old, she has survived a childhood of the Black Death epidemic, but now she endures seven days and seven nights of illness that seem sure to be her end. Her curate holds a crucifix before her as comfort in her last moments, and her mother closes her eyes, apparently for the last time. This is when the woman receives 15 divine visions, or shoeings. Miraculously, she lives to the next morning when she receives the 16th. She makes a full recovery, but the experience has changed her. The visions brought her closer to God even by the standards of a devout Christian community. Self-described as a simple creature that knew no letter, she nonetheless determined to understand what she had seen. There is one path ahead of her that will give her a lifetime of prayer, study and self-reflection. In her hometown of Norwich, there is a small but growing community, the majority women, who have dedicated themselves to deep spiritual thought. The young woman makes a life-changing decision to join them. She reaches out to a priest with her request, and she proves she has the financial means to sustain her new life. He accepts and she prepares to exit secular life. In a sombre ceremony, the woman is led to a small room attached to a church where there is only a simple bed and essential furnishings. A mass takes place which includes prayers for the dead, signifying that she is now dead to the world. Then the door to the small room is sealed shut and she remains there for the decades that follow. But her life goes on. Her room has windows which she uses every day. One is a squint which looks onto the church altar so she can attend daily mass. Another is used to give advice and counsel to visitors. Over her time in the church, she has at least two servants who help her with her daily needs. Her days feature a tight schedule of prayers, contemplation and dedication to the ascetic way of life. Some of her peers also produce useful goods for the outside community, like woven and sewn fabrics. But the now enclosed woman uses most of her time for ruminating on the visions she received and all the wise and sometimes seemingly contradictory things they have to say. Despite her reclusion, she is known in the community and she receives visitors seeking her words. One of them is another devout woman who has travelled far on pilgrimages to sacred sites and to the residences of the most renowned religious thinkers. The two women converse, learn from each other and then part ways to search for more insight to add to their writings. Because the enclosed woman is learning to understand those visions from so many years ago, she records them in writing and details everything she has learned during her solitary way of life. These writings amount to over 60,000 words and they are named Revelations of Divine Love. Contrary to what might be perceived as a life of solitude, boredom and imprisonment, her writings are full of hope, comfort and joy for the earthly and heavenly worlds. The woman I am talking about is Julian of Norwich. She was an anchoress, the name for a woman who encloses herself inside a cell adjoining a church to engage in a lifetime of deep prayer. She likely took her name from the church where she resided, St Julian's Church in Norwich. Revelations of Divine Love is one of the most extensive surviving pieces of writing by a woman from the medieval period. The woman who visited Julian's cell was Marjorie of Kemp. Both were solitary yet sociable in their own ways, and they both wrote about what they learned during their spiritual journeys. And yet it is Julian's decision to see out her days in a small room for a church, not Marjorie's pilgrimages, that seem most unfathomable to our modern minds. I first learned about the Anchoresses, the male form of which is Anchorite, when reading the early Middle English text, The Anchor in Wissa. It was written to advise three sisters during their time as anchoresses. It became popular among the anchoress community, being copied many times across the next couple of centuries, and that's just in the manuscripts that have survived. Reading the anchor in Wissa gave me the what the heck is this history feeling where something is so far removed from your modern perspective that you fail to process it. It wasn't just the fact that the anchoresses spent their lives living in a single room. It was that the anchor in Wissa is written using all the familiar tropes of medieval chivalric romance literature, a genre that famously mixes secular, religious and cultural belief without any concern for the consequences. It compares an anchoress's relationship with God to the courtly love between a knight and a lady. Think of a highly devout monastic rule book and combine it with castles and chivalry. It's one of the most medieval texts I've read. And then there is the actual advice for everyday activities as an anchoress. 
Pretty hands are seen as a sign of idleness and that's not allowed in ascetic life. So ladies, it's time to start digging your own grave with your bare hands in your tiny cell. My young brain could not cope with this. After returning to the enclosed lives of the Anchoresses for this video, I wanted to try to truly understand why someone would make this life-altering decision and what it would have been like after doing so. I've read through the Anchoress text, looked at the archaeology and considered medieval culture and it's really not as wild as you might think when first hearing about the Anchoresses and the Anchorites. Because, well, it turns out you can't even research some little-known medieval history without realising it's full of internet myths. With a topic like Anchoresses, it's easy to sensationalise it for clicks. Like, did you know in medieval times they would brick women into a room for life? And before they placed the last brick, they would recite the same prayers used for when someone died. And if while in prison the Anchoresses were getting too comfortable, they would start digging their own graves. It's not necessarily untrue, but the internet always takes the real sources and blows them out of proportion. In the Anchor and Whistler, the author does say that Anchoresses should not have soft pretty hands because that would be a sign of idleness and vanity. And so they make a suggestion for how to avail this failing. And yes, it is to dig their graves with their bare hands. And obviously that's something shocking from real historic records that the internet loves. But consider it realistically. The Anchor in Wissa is a book of advice written for three anchoresses to help them through their new lives. It's one writer's suggestion for what they could do. There's no evidence that anchoresses actually follow this particular bit of advice. They were probably too busy praying or contemplating existence. So what were the anchoresses really all about? You might have heard of the feudal system in relation to medieval society. Basically, it's the idea that society was structured around few people hoarding land in exchange for work from the many. There has been some criticism for this model and lots of historians agree that this is a simplification that doesn't reflect medieval society completely. But one idea that does help explain how medieval society worked and that was actually referenced at the time is the separation of people into three groups. Those who pray, those who work and those who fight. Those who worked kept daily society functional. Those who fought protected everyone. Those who prayed were responsible for everyone's well-being, whether on earth or in death. This shows just how important religious figures were. Religious communities were there to pray on everyone's behalf, and some people chose to take on this important role. This means that even in isolation, there was a strong social element to the Anchorites' lives. Anger holes were attached to religious buildings, which were full of people carrying out their religious duties and they were the hub of the community, with locals turning up regularly for worship. The life of an anchorite was a relatively popular choice. In the 13th century, there were around 200 anchorites in England. The practice only declined during the religious instability of the 16th century. Henry VIII and Edward VI's Protestant reforms involved forcibly kicking out the anchorites from their holes. But before that, there was a contradiction in the Anchorites' daily lives, where they were supposed to be carrying out contemplative worship alone, but the whole local community knew where they lived, what they were doing, and why. People would come to visit the Anchorites and Anchoresses, seeking advice and wisdom. Because if you spend your whole existence thinking about how to live the most spiritual life, it's likely you'd have some useful things to say about it. One of the Anchorites' windows was for receiving visitors. Sister Bertke was an anchoress in the centre of her Dutch community who had frequent visitors and who wrote many songs. When she died, the church bells rung twice to announce the news, as they did upon the death of the prelate. We know that visitors were a common part of anchoresses' daily lives because their advice books discouraged them from receiving visitors too often and from speaking about anything that isn't strictly related to spirituality. Hetta Howes deftly describes his inconsistency as sociable solitude, and so the life of an anchoress was not so isolated as it may seem. One thing that is often commented on is the fact that there were many more female anchoresses than male anchorites. It's hard to know the exact numbers, but it seems that there were roughly double the number of women who chose this than the number of men. So why might women have felt more compelled to take on this isolated way of life? One explanation used to explain this phenomenon is that women wanted to escape medieval misogyny or an unwanted marriage. So instead of carrying out their prescribed satirical role to marry Joffrey, they would instead go in and live an enclosed life in a little room where they would never have to see his greasy hair again. But I think there is more to it than that. I won't go into it now, but I'm not a fan of the brand of feminism that projects heightened misogyny onto the past and uses that to explain women's history in terms of their oppression. 
it kind of takes away their agency and the many factors that would have gone into their choices. Because it was a choice, they would have had to have inquired about becoming an anchoress and prove that they were a suitable candidate. One of my explanations for why there were more anchoresses than anchorites is that there were just fewer official worlds women in the religious sphere, and becoming an anchoress was one way in. If you were pious enough and if you had enough money, you would probably be accepted into a religious community as that anchoress. My other explanation is that some women may have felt compelled to take on the role of an anchoress because the expected path for women in medieval society just wasn't for them. I don't mean this in the sense that becoming an anchoress was their only way to escape the patriarchy, but in the sense that the other options available, like marriage, just didn't seem very compelling to medieval women who would rather spend their time quietly contemplating and praying for the good of the community. Remember, this is a deeply religious society. Regular life is full of earthly distractions like deciding what's for dinner and making sure that everyone has shoes that fit. For a woman who didn't feel like this life was right for her, she might have been pulled towards an alternative lifestyle where she could write and think and participate in important religious practices without having to carry out other duties instead. There weren't too many other ways for women to contribute to theological thinking and to write at length about their perspective on the world. I think the 14th century wife of Bath from the Canterbury Tales explains this very well. She basically says that some women chose to be pure and chaste while others can choose to, well, be the opposite. And it's all fine because both are essential. Some women pray for everyone's souls while others, you know, made sure that human beings continue to exist. The Anchoresses made their choice to carry out the former role, just in a slightly more extreme way than was strictly conventional. That said, I don't want to discount the suggestion that sometimes becoming an anchoress really was an escape from the outside world, its expectations, and its dangers. In one archaeological site of a former church, there is evidence of an anchor hold with a female skeleton buried inside. Tests on her remains suggest that she may have had syphilis, which would mean that she wouldn't have exactly been a chaste anchoress. An article about the archaeological dig asks whether people around her would have recognised the disease and if her entry into the anchor hold was voluntary or under duress. The severity of the disease suggests it was contracted when she was young. I don't think we can rule out the possibility that some women chose to be anchoresses in response to a trauma. And this brings us to my last anchoress question. Were they actually walled into a single room for life? The internet would have you believe that they were, but the actual descriptions from the medieval texts are more vague. They say the anchoresses were enclosed or sealed in the anchor hold. This is probably more of a symbolic phrasing than a literal meaning. They might have been enclosed in their life of solitude, but there was still, you know, a door. Some examples of surviving anchor holds have doors, like this reconstruction of Julian of Norwich's anchor hold. But with church architecture changing and shifting over hundreds of years, it's hard to know exactly what the building would have looked like at a specific time. As for written evidence, it does seem that anchorites and anchoresses left their anchor holes from time to time. One anchorite from Winchester travelled to give advice to Richard Beauchamp, the Earl of Warwick, because he was too busy to visit himself, suggesting that important trips were allowed. Not all anchoresses behaved, and they weren't always scandal-free recluses on the edge of medieval society. And then there was anchoress Christine Carpenter, who faced disgrace after she was discovered outside her anchor hold. She appealed to the Pope, who allowed her to re-enter again as an anchoress, but this time with heightened security. It seems this may have been when the door was removed from the anchor hold, which shows that an absence of a door wasn't the default state. Some anchoresses even took others into their anchor holds and had their own sub-community. Jutta von Sponheim was a very devout anchoress who, some might argue, took things to the extreme, refusing the modifications to the Benedictine diet when she was sick and praying bare feet during winter. But still, she tutored some pupils and they lived with her, forming a tiny sort of boarding school in her anger hold. Her most famous pupil was Hildegard von Bingen, who went on to write influential religious music. Despite her solitary way of life, Jutta von Sponheim maintained connections with the monastery next to her anchor hold, where she was the abbess. Anchoresses were devoted to their isolated way of life and ensured they stuck to their promise as much as possible, but practically there were likely some movements between the anchor hold and the less secluded community surrounding them. From situations including attending to a sick anchoress to carrying out duties for the rest of the community, the exact situation of an anchoress's enclosement depended on their personal situation, preferences and the people around them. 
Some might have literally been bricked into a room, while others may have left during very limited circumstances. The size of the room varied, and so did its position in relation to the church or monastery. Some anchor holds had gardens or multiple rooms, or were a few more personal amenities. There were hundreds of different anchorites and anchoresses, and each one had a different way of carrying out their enclosement. After researching anchoresses and their solitary way of life, I no longer feel like it's such a strange concept. These were women who identified that the path laid out in front of them wouldn't make them feel fulfilled, so they instead took on the unique opportunity to live their lives in silent contemplation, where they could think and write and tutor and give advice and earn the respect of the community while carrying out an essential role for society. And honestly, I have to respect them for that. <laughs>